This is USC legend Gary Goodrich. I'm about to do an interview with Great North Wrestling. Come watch it. So you were uh, born in Trinidad. Do you have any memories of uh, Trinidad before you came to Canada? Absolutely. I have some, a lot of memories. Um, uh, my long-term memory is impeccable. The first thing I remember uh, uh, as a kid, I remember um, being on the floor on my dad's feet. Um, I don't think I was able to walk, but that's the first thing I remember. Yes, yeah, so I have many memories over there. And what brought you to uh, Canada? My parents wanted a better life for their children, so I moved here. How old would you have been at that point? I was seven. Okay. Did you play any sports growing up? Um, yeah, I played hockey, and um, I, I think I just played, sorry, I just played hockey. And you got into arm wrestling pretty young. Uh, what got you into arm wrestling? Well, I used to arm wrestle my dad at the kitchen table all the time and uh, try to man up and beat him all the time. And he used to beat me with one finger. And uh, I just went from there and I just went a step further than just dad at the kitchen table. I went to, had to go all the way. And uh, when you were arm wrestling, what kind of uh, weight training did you do to uh, train for that sport? Oh man, that, uh, that, that, that was hard. Arm wrestling is harder than it thinks, harder than it looks like. Uh, a lot of um, one arm, try, uh, trying hard to do one arm chin up, I eventually did it. Chin ups with weighted, uh, weighted um, weights, uh, hold on and hang on. The, the flex arm hang that you did um, in school, I used to do that and try to hold on with, um, try to put 50 pounds on, 75 pounds, 80 pounds on, 100 pounds on, as much as you can and still hold it um, for arm muscle. And you, you need to strengthen your arm, your tendons, not what, the muscle. What was your hammer curl? My arm curl? Mm. I think I tried 100 pounds a couple of times, but uh, table curl, I was over um, with uh, 235. That's amazing. One arm. And is it true you were in over the top? Yes, I was. I was uh, I was there. Um, it was the best in Canada. Um, sorry, they had a World Arm Wrestling Championships, and all the different world championships had their own. And then we met up in Las Vegas on um, July 26th, uh, 1986. To uh, to shoot that that movie, and um, that that was, they had the world championship there. So when you actually see the movie, there's there's actually the real world championship going on at the time. So they used all those people to, to do the show. What point are you in it for people that want to go back and watch and look at the it? very end when they all then they give up flash shots of uh, at the very end. And what did you think of that movie? Do you think it was good for the sport, uh, or do you think it was kind of? Yeah, it was. It was. It was kind of a uh, beat of what the sport was. But you know what? Um, uh, and, and being much older now, at uh, at the, at fifty, it was. It was what the sport needed. People were saying back then, ah, the sport didn't need that. That ruined it. Let me tell you, uh, our muscles a tough sport, and um, any any kind of publicity for them is good publicity. And Scott Norton was also in that movie. He was a wrestler, an arm wrestler. Did you ever uh, come across Scott in your arm wrestling? Uh, you know what? We never arm wrestled. We met up in um, met up in Japan. As a matter of fact, I talked to Scott Norton two days ago. Um, so he's making a comeback, right? Yeah, well, the arm wrestling. Yeah, we, we both said that we're going to try it, uh, to come back uh, next year. And uh, he's been working hard. And we, we both talked. I talked to him again about professional wrestling and stuff. Uh, we, like I said, just talked to him two days ago. It's funny you weren't your name. Um, so you are thinking of making a comeback? Absolutely. Have you heard of this WAL league? That's I've heard about the WAL, UFL, that, that, that. There's all sorts of different leagues, but you know what? I'm, I'm not really part of any group. I'm just going to come back for myself. I, I don't want to be any in any group, and I'm, it's, it's, I'm not impressed with that. Have you ever heard of Devin Larratt? Yes, I've heard of Devin Larratt. What do you think of him? Yeah, I, I really don't know the guy. I see him um, arm wrestling and beating people and holding on to them and last, last, you know, and it, you know, I, I really don't, I, I don't have any thing about Devin Larratt, how I feel, you know. How do you He's think a, you would do in an arm wrestling match against him if you were in the, t in the top shape that you were? I would beat him for yeah. sure. I believe that I would beat him. And uh, he's actually a friend of mine. He had a question he wanted me to ask you, and that is, uh, your hands aren't necessarily as big as the average arm wrestler. Yeah. How did you end up doing so well with uh, smaller hands? It was just, um, the thing about me is I, was, I had a lot of speed. And on top of that, I had a lot of strength. So um, I would either be, make, your, make you beat, I would beat you in um, strength 
or speed. Sometimes um, I was very fast off the start, so we didn't start. When when you start here, sometimes um, before when the, when the, when the referee says go, you actually have you start here. So then to pull somebody down from there is like a couple of inches to move is very easy. But um, what I see is people start here. And they say, ready, go. And they both stay there. No, but I hit you hard. So it st- comes here. So it was, a, it was a big plus for me. And did you ever end up uh, arm wrestling a thousand people in a row in Japan? Yes, I did. How did that whole thing come about? Y- you know what? First, um, um, the Japanese called me one night um, before um, uh, before I left to go to um, go, go to Japan. They, they called me, Gary Goodrich, how you doing? Um, listen, it's like three o'clock in the morning there. Um, can you come to Japan? And I said, sure. I said, oh, we want you to arm us a hundred people. I did, and that, that happened the first year. And then they called me back the next year. Um, Gary, this is blah, 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 from uh, what? Uh, can you arm us on other people, hundred people? And I said, absolutely, sure. So um, as um, they said, okay, we'll send you a ticket. So they sent me a, uh, they were sending me a ticket. I was supposed to leave the next morning. Um, another group calls me up. Uh, Gary, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, would, would you like to arm? Uh, can you arm us a thousand people? And I said, absolutely, sure. So they, um, I said, well, I'll be in Japan tomorrow. Come meet me in the hotel. I'm at uh, this hotel, Akasaka Prince Hotel. Um, just meet me there. So um, I got off the phone and I thought, wow, this, what's going on over there? So I, I got over there. I met the guy, the, the people that I was uh, working with, and then the other people came up for a thousand people, and we worked out a deal, and uh, it was great. And I went over there and I almost saw a thousand people on New Year's Eve. Was it getting tough towards the end? No, not at all. It was. It was like, it. I mean, it was. I had ten and nineties for that last me forever after that. Yeah. But it was like arm. I was like arm curling a thousand, um, five pounds a thousand times. You know, the first. 500 was easy, but then the second 500, I got that really bad 10 and I just from doing that, but uh, it was all worth it. I think they gave me um, 50,000 for beating 1,000, and then if I won the whole thing without losing it all, they gave me 100. That's pretty good. So they, I never lost. And you beat <laughs> uh, the arm wrestling legend, Cleve Dean. Yeah, I beat him a few times, yeah. Yeah, what are your thoughts on beating him? You know what? Um, his hand just engulfed my hand. And my thoughts were, wow, I, am I going to beat this guy? And uh, again, it was um, it was speed, speed that pulled him down. I, I jumped him to uh, the start, ready, go, go to the start. And from there, he just panicked and his wrist gave and he, yeah, his wrist gave him and I, I got the win. That's, a, that's the last time we arm wrestled. But before that, it was, uh, I saw John Brzezink beat him. Then I thought, hey, if, if John could beat him, I could beat him because I was beating John. And what year was it that you won the world championship? Oh man, I won it just several, several, and almost in several world championships. Is there much money in that sport? No, no. Well, for, well you know what? From when I was there, there was not enough. Um, the most money I ever made was almost on a um, thousand people, um, but there's there was no money in it. That's that's why I went over to um to fight him. I was the top arm wrestler in Canada, in the world. Um, I won 11 world titles and, and there was no money. I, I, um, so then UFC came up. And I looked at myself, they're paying me $50,000 to go beat up somebody. I'm going. Right. You know, so I, that's that's where I went. I didn't win $50,000. Mind you, I won 10000 for coming second. But it was still 10000 more than what Armasel paid me is for it, all them years. Is it true that you actually got it, got the job in UFC because of your arm wrestling? Absolutely. Um, I, my, my, um, my, my, uh, my resume looked good, and I, I was part of my resume. And before you did UFC, you did some boxing. Uh, how did you end up getting into boxing? Um, I, you know, I I, I like many many kids uh, that are around my age. I grew up watching Muhammad Ali, and um, I just thought I was supposed to be Muhammad Ali. I thought I was. I I knew. I felt that greatness was awaiting me, and. Um, I I couldn't I couldn't think what it was. So then I, I started boxing when I was. My dad put me in a class boxing. Join me, sorry, karate class, and I started that. And I hated it, man. I I think I went to three classes, and I every time my father would drive me there, I'd run around the end of the building and play with the kids. 
Um, and then we, he used to bring me from Barry to Toronto to um, go to this boxing classes all the time. And, and he said, oh, well, you can't do boxing. You got too many scars on your head. They'll open up. And I hated boxing when I was a kid. And then as I got older, um, I just I, I came back to it again when I was about 19. And I won the um, Canadian Championship in boxing. Um, super heavyweight division. Super heavyweight. Oh, you're, you're yeah. good. You got good stuff, huh? Yeah, um, I did win that. And then from there, that I used those credentials to get in the UFC. So there was no thoughts of getting into pro boxing? Um, I was allergic to boxing. And what happened was, how I knew I was allergic to it, it's that how when I fought it, my lips would grow here and there, and my eyes would blacken, and my eyes would swell out. I was allergic to that, man. <laughs> I was allergic to getting punched in the head. And you were in UFC pretty much from the start. Uh, how did you first find out about UFC? You know, I've, a few friends of mine were watching um, were watching the UFC, and uh, they, they called me. I, where I work at Honda Kinder Manufacturing, where I work, and they said, well, you got to come over and watch the USC 3 tape or the USC um, 2 tapes, um, one or two. And said, you got to come over and see it. They got this guy that time, and he breaks their arm, and he puts them in this, and does this. Uh, and they're just going crazy about it. So, yeah, I said, I'll come over and watch it. So a bunch of us go over and settle down and go over to this guy's house on a VHS way back then. Uh, that's how long ago was. We watch, put it on a VHS, and put it in it, and then we're watching this thing. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm like, oh Jesus, I don't want to do that. And my mind was saying that, but of course, I'm the biggest in the room, like y'all, you are. I'm the biggest in the room, and everybody's telling me to do it. Like, but it was only the bravado that that pushed me to do it. I I have wanted nothing to do with that. At that Be point, there was no rules, right? No weight classes. No, no there was no. Yeah, the, I mean, I was too sick at the time, but I wanted nothing to do with that. But so then, by the time the end of the show, um, the VHS show, by the time it's almost done, they're all enjoying your C shirts and you want to see this and the, the 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 fight card and send away and, and you can get it. So they get on the phone. So they get on the phone and, and get the numbers. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. USC, I, up to now, I haven't said that I'm, I'm doing anything because I didn't want to do it. Right. Oh, oh we, we don't want to do it. We, we got somebody that wants to fight. So they got this number, that this number, they got this number, this number, some of that number. And yeah, I think they called about four different people that night. And finally, they got a hold of Art Davies. It's a guy that I called my dad today. Um, he um, got me into the UFC. Um, he just saw <laughs> that the funny thing is, Three days before I was talking to Art Davies on the phone for the very first time, he saw my match with Clay Dean. And he said, um, yeah, I was watching World of Sports. He said, first time, I said, this is Gary Goodrich. He said, this is Gary Goodrich? He said, I just saw you beat that behemoth, Clay Dean, like three days ago. So this is Gary. He said, you spoke well. UFC has a place for you. And that's how I got into the UFC. Just because I spoke well and he saw me. Mm -hmm. Art Davies is the guy who invented the UFC. He came up with it. He is the original mindset for UFC. So were you so hesitant when you got the call? Oh, absolutely. I When I finally got the, okay, you're, you're fighting in UFC 8. You're going to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And that was like um, three weeks before I was going. Um, the free, uh, that had like three, sorry, I had a month to prepare for that I'm like oh I was like scared I had like shaking like what's going on like I, I I hadn't trained to this point I knew nothing about this there was no MMA training so no so did you have your flight paid what was the financial deal going into that UFC age oh they, they paid absolutely everything they, they paid myself and uh, I think two other people have come with me and but uh, we had a whole entourage come down there what was the uh, environment like backstage? Uh, because UFC was still pretty new, a lot of first-time fighters. Oh, it was electrifying. I mean, um, I think they got kicked out of a show um, doing it at, in Detroit. So they had to do it down there. And um, thing there, you, you didn't know if the show was going on because things were shutting off. Uh, and this is going back to UFC 8, 9, UFC 10. Um, then I went to Ultimate, Ultimate 96. Then UFC um, 19 was my last UFC. But so when you're behind the stage, um, when you're behind uh, and all this stuff is going on you're just thinking wow um, well, is this show going to happen Is because uh, we're kicked out of so many different places 
So what was the deal financially? Because it was a tournament format for that, right? Yeah. You got paid more according to how many fights you won and you got a certain amount just to show up. Yeah. No, what, what it was, yes, you're, the, you're absolutely right. The winner got $5,000. Um, Don Fry won, so he got, sorry, $50,000. The winner won $50,000. I came second, so I won $10,000. And I think after that, it was 2000 and then everybody got a thousand to show up. So you had to fight no rules, no rules, bare knuckles three times to earn ten thousand dollars. Exactly. I, I did win a, a new rules tournament. I never won a UFC. Uh, I won matches in the UFC, but I never won the UFC. The UFC that I the sorry the the bare knuckles one that I won. Do you, do you have that there? Yeah, it's I, in uh, was in Brazil, right? The IVC, yes. Yeah. I won. I became the IVC champion. Still today is the IVC champion. Wow. And your first UFC fight is probably your most famous because of how you finished the guy off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was that just random, or were you planning? No. Um, what happened was uh, when I was in uh, when we were in San Juan, Puerto Rico. If people remember way back when, uh, you're probably too young, but uh, <laughs> but when we remember way back then, um, USC would have a bunch of people come out as your fight and say, "Well, we did this, we did this, that's what I'm gonna do to you." Every every single person had a little skit to do, yeah. whatever you want to do to introduce yourself to the crowd and what you might do or gonna do. So um, we used to see this um, Paul Herrera doing the same thing over and over. I, I, my group realized who I'm fighting first, and we zeroed in on Paul Herrera. Watch how he walked, how he talked, um, what he's doing. If he had to, if he was training, we wanted to go see his training. And I just sent people out to go see him because I wanted to know everything about this person I possibly could. Well, we used to see him on down on the beach, and his his, his spiel to the camera was, "I'm um, I, I am Paul Herrera." He runs in and does a fireman carry. Yeah. And I said, "Well, that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna do that fireman carry." So then we stayed up the whole night before that. Um, trying to combat the, do something you know think against the fireman carry and that's what we came up with clenching the legs uh, the arms falling back and, and actually it was supposed to be bending his wrist for a submission but I just went for the elbows and what was your thoughts on the uh, reaction to that because it re replayed so many times over the years well yeah, I really didn't know how good it was um, I, I, I had no idea it was as smooth as it looked I, I really didn't. I, would, I just was just afraid of, of this 189-pound uh, guy beating me. As I said, I was 260, you know? Yeah. So I was just afraid of having this 189-pound soaking wet. And he probably lied about his weight. He probably lived less than that. Yeah. And uh, I was afraid of him beating me. Because there were no way in. Right? There was no way. No, you didn't weigh in. You just came in and fought. Is it true that someone told you that him and Tank Abbott were white supremacists? Yes, they told me that he, they were. Well, the group, well, the group that I was with, um, I was like nerves was killing me, man. I was being killed with nerves because I didn't want to look like a fool to the world, losing to this guy that's 189 pounds. And had it not ended up that way, he would have wrestled me down and stayed on top because he was an avid wrestler. I didn't know that at the time. I just did not want to lose to a little guy, you know. So I, I did. They tried. They, they tried. I was like, you, you go when you're in the back, you go down on the high, you, like you're coming down, and when it's come down, and you're doubting yourself. And you have all sorts of millions of doubts in your head. So they, they tell me, no, man, he's a white white supremacist guy. He's with Tank Abbott. He's a, and they're, they're, they don't like black people. So that sparked me up. To, so that I felt, well, yeah, is he a white? He doesn't like black too. You know what? I'm not going to lose him. It just got me fired up to that I wanted to beat him. And, and they gave me this, and we learned how to do this. We stayed up all night learning how to do that move. And that's what happened. And what are your thoughts on uh, Tank Abbott? You never fought him, but I'm sure you were around him. You know what? Tank Abbott's a very intelligent man. Um, when, he, when, when you see him in the ring and you see him do stupid things, uh, he's a very intelligent It's like Conor McGregor, you know, um, very intelligent. Tank Abbott was very intelligent, and he hit like a he hit like a ton of bricks. You know, uh, he's a very very nice person. And uh, your last fight on that first pay per view was against Don Fry. Yeah. What are your memories of that fight and your your continuous uh, matches with him? Because I think you had three altogether. Yeah, yeah. The first match, I fought Don Fry like the the, the my first night after Paul Herrera, I, I went to Jerry Bolander, and Jerry Bolander was from the Mines Den. He um. He was able to 
get me tired. I didn't know. I didn't even know he had enough cardio for this damn thing. I thought it was just you go out there and fight. I had no idea whatsoever you need cardio. So I fought Jerry Bolander, and the white match lasted in five minutes. By the time I got back, my my corner had to pick me up and drag me out to the roof, uh, to the to the back, and I'm like sucking wind in this black gi. You know? <sighs> so they took off the gi so I can breathe, and they're fanning me and doing all this and to get me some air. And uh, then I got, I uh, said, so well, who do I have to look on the thing? Then they heard John, oh, Don Fry just knocked out the, um, um, the, uh, the uh, 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 zombie from uh, some whatever, the, a 410-pound zombie. It was uh, the, the, the um, David against Goliath. And John Fry was the smallest David, sorry, the biggest David. I was the smallest Goliath. So we meet in the end to each other. I beat up all my guys, and he beat up all his, and we met in the end together. His two matches were like seconds. My two were, well, I, Jerry Bolander took me five minutes, but first one was a couple seconds. Finally, we are going up against each other. I knew, uh, here's the thing. Beside, in the back of the, in the, in the hall, it was like um, in, a, in a hockey arena. And beside this, this arena, all the, everybody is set out long, dumb fries, so there's no individual dressing rooms. No, there's no one. There's it. one, but the thing is that how they're, it's the, the only thing that separates the dressing room is a sheet. You know, so y- you can hear everything that's going on. Don Fry's right beside my corner. So when I came back in the room, they, they everybody dragged me back, came back to my own. I can't fight. I can't fight. Um, then people understood that he's back to, beside me. He's, you're fighting him next. You're fighting him next. So be quiet. Be quiet. Shh. shh. I'm like, oh man, guys, I, uh, I can't. I'm not telling you, man. I can't fight. I, I can't. Shh, shh. And then, um, so then I had another guy. And the guys in the back there, they started hitting the pads like if I was warming up. Uh, so he started hitting the pads. So so the the sounds would hear. He would hear like I'm warming up and hitting fast. You know, going on. And um, so then I got, I got out of there, and then when they dragged me out, I said, "Oh, you know, I have about thirty seconds of gas, and after that, you guys got to pull the cord, throw in the towel." So I got in there, and we started fighting. And I I started feeling good as I got to walk out. Started feeling good. Started fighting, feeling really good, and then finally we um we fought, and yeah, I think we we went five minutes. So it was awesome. Loved and, him. Uh, your second fight, I guess, was in. Pride. The second fight, no, was in um, was yeah, in uh, Ultimate it. Ultimate ninety six. Okay, that's the one that Don Fry beat everybody, and he won. Um, what happened was uh, same thing happened again. I ran out of uh, out of cardio, and he ended up beating me again. And then we fought again in uh, the last time I was in uh, Pride. Um, I was leaving Pride, and. Um, after that, I obviously went over to K1, but I was leaving Pride, and uh, I started uh, doing some, started fighting different ways, um, um, learning how to kick, I stretch, and uh, you, neither of us worked out for the fight at all. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and we're just, you know, every time I see him, he's like this, and he's sore, and I can see him, like he, he was sore. So was I. We did, I didn't train a second for that fight. They offered me the fight. I took the fight. I didn't train one bit for that fight, so... If I didn't knock him out, um, we're gonna look terrible. We look like two old men trying to fight each other. That's what we look like. And then finally, we ended up um, we ended up fighting. And I saw his hands were low, and I, I'm gonna try for a head kick. And I went for a head kick and got him knocked out. And what are your thoughts on his uh, personal issues that he's had in recent years? He's had uh, some right, time. right now, he's going through issues. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I, I love Don Fly. Don Fry, um, you know, I, he's having a rough time. He went, uh, you know, I, you know, I went to um, I went to Brazil with Don Fry, and that's when I really got to know him. With Don Fry and Coleman and myself, we went to Brazil, and uh, we did a, a bunch of things over there, helping out the Brazilians and moving there in Bali too, though. And um, I really got to know Don Fry there, and then we fought in Pride, and we fought all around. And, you know, so we're always very close. We started the very same day. And then he went off to professional wrestling. But uh, we always had a good camaraderie. I have his phone number. We can, I can call him right now. Um, he's a good man, um, but he's he's bullheaded. He's, he's just 
when he has something in his mind that's in his mind and, and him and his wife were going through problems uh, i won't tell you what the problems are but they were going through problems and started separating going their own way and you know um, it's bothering him it's bothering her and they called and kind of put me in the middle and um you know um I wish him the best. He's got, he's got a rough time. He's, he's having a rough time. He's had a rough life. You know, he's had a rough go, like, because he's, um, he's been beat, he's been beaten up and beaten down. Like, uh, like I said, Preston Russell, he's, he's, he's got a wrecked up back. He's got this, he's got that. He's, uh, trying to come out of us, out of a hole. And, uh, your second UFC was UFC nine, uh, in Detroit. Yes against uh, an Olympic champion wrestler. Yes. Schultz. Yeah. That wasn't your original opponent. Uh, no, it was, um, it was um, uh, David Benatol. They were, they were going to call the Canada's, Canada's Championship. And uh, it was against David Benatol. Thank God he broke his hand because he would have mopped up the floor with me. He, he would have beaten me bad. Uh, Schultz, um, was, uh, Schultz was great. And uh, I still, I still talked, to, I talked to Schultz last week. Very, very good man. He's having a problem. But we're going to, we're actually going to, we're going to take a lot of the um, old, uh, well, we're going to take all the old fighters that uh, that fought in the UFC. And we're going to, we're opening up um, a bodyguard service with all the old fighters from the UFC to, um, uh, to bodyguard. So we're going to bodyguard people. So you were actually relieved when you were uh, told you were fighting the Olympic champion? Oh no, I was. I was. Um, I I looked at him and he was small. I knew yeah. Dave Penito was my size. Yeah. And I looked at Mark and I was like, wow, yeah, I was relieved because he was smaller. But man, the guy was <laughs> like a fire plug, man. And I noticed for that fight, you had a big entourage with you. Were those just your buddies, or did you actually have to pay those guys? To- no, they're they're just my buddies. They're just my buddies. Everybody wanted. Oh, you're on the UFC. Everybody's coming with you. Wants to come and wants to be there. And it was so close to home that uh, everybody, even more people, want to come. And they did a CBC story on you for that one. Uh, did you ever see the final? Never story? did. <laughs> Never did. And uh, I guess uh, you fought after that, Mark Coleman in the yeah. UFC. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, fighting with him? Yo, know, Mark Coleman was tough, man. He was, he was, you know, every time I started winning something, uh, he he was he took it away from me. I think he was like, um, like uh, like a lion playing with its cub. You know, he lets you give him a little bit and then grab and snatch you back. You know, give it a little bit more and rah, you know, and he, he just controlled me like uh, I, I I had to do whatever he wanted to do. And there were some headbutts used in that match. Absolutely. Do you think it's good that headbutts are out, or did you prefer it when it was uh, more no holds barred? You know what? I'm glad that I have the headbutts are out um, because he was he was trying to headbutt me at the time and I opened up my mouth to threaten him that how he's going to headbutt me in the teeth and they're going to cut his head. You know, so he was headbutting. <laughs> I opened up my mouth and I angled it so that how if he headbutt, he's going to headbutt my teeth and it could cut him. You know, that's and that's exactly what he was thinking. So he stopped headbutting. What are your thoughts on Dan Severn? He had such a long career, and uh, you were around in the UFC at the same time as him. You know, um, Dan Severn's a little earlier than me. He's from probably UFC two or something like that. But uh, Dan Severn's a good man. He's a uh, he's, he's a he's a worker. You know, he's he works. You know, he's he's a worker. He's um, professional wrestling. He's just working. He's always he's busy. He's always. He, Put rights on everything on a piece you want. When he's at a fight, he's going to see, and he hasn't even fought yet. He's working on the next fight next week. He's working on it at it right now. Even in the change room, he's going over it. What's happening? And did you have much contact with Ken Shamrock over the years? Absolutely, absolutely. Ken Shamrock, great guy, just hot tempered. Um, there's out of the whole, out of the whole fighting fighting um, thing, I met two people that were just super hot headed, and two of them. Vanderlei Silva and Ken Shamrock. Man, I mean, so this guy's fly. Oh, sorry. And Kevin uh, Kevin Randleman. Fly off the handle quick like that. And Severin has said uh, numerous times that he believes Shamrock was on steroids in those early UFC years. Uh, was there any testing in those early years? Uh, um, you know what? I, I don't think there was. But you know what? If you're going to beat somebody, you're going to beat them. If you're going to lose them, you're going to lose them. What? what Steroids are gonna make make it a little stronger, make me not. They're not gonna. The steroids go against your cardio. So you know what? Somebody's calling you. <laughs>
Uh, steroids help you a little bit, but who knows? Who knows? And uh, I know you weren't in the UFC at all when Kimbo was there, but what are your thoughts on Kimbo Slice and his uh, recent death? Yeah, you know, I'm sorry that he died. You know, I, I, I don't... I, I, I can't tell you how I really feel because he's passed away now, but, you know, I feel sorry that he's not died and left his family. And, you know, he's, I know he's got uh, some children and, and they're, they're missing their dad. But, uh, yeah, it's a bad, it's a bad, when anyone's life gets taken away or cut <clears throat> short than what it should be, you know, it's, 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 it's terrible. I, I, I can, all I can do is, uh, Pray for his family. Have you seen his son uh, fight? Because his son, Baby Slice, has uh, started to do MMA now. Is that his name, Baby yeah, Slice? Yeah. I have no. I've, I've never. I've never even heard of him. I wish he did have one knockout. That's the only fight I've seen of him. Yeah. That was fairly impressive. But I guess it remains to be seen how he'll do. Yeah. And uh, he brought up Valley Tudo. Uh, how did you end up going to Brazil for those fights? And what's the difference between Valley Tudo? And uh, MMA in the states, rules wise. You know what? Yeah, Valley Tudo. I, they called me over, and they, I, I was at home. And Mario Yamazaki and uh, Fernando Yamazaki called me up. Hey Gary, Brazil, you want to come? Okay, yeah, let's go. So I was on my way. Um, next day, I was on my way to Brazil to go and participate in the Valley Tudo competition. And um, and I um, the fight, the 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 thing, somebody said. Oh, sorry. Gary, do you want to fight in uh, Valley Judo in, in Brazil? Brazil. I said, um, sure, absolutely. Um, what, what's the, what do you do? Uh, he said, well, there's no rules. He says, I said, there's no rules? He says, yeah, there's no rules. Are you sure there's, you sure there's no rules? Said, yeah, there's no rules in this thing. You just go on over. So I think, wow. Well, I got a couple fights behind me. I, I feel all right. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I'll come over and fight. No rules. So I get down there, and the guys come on. Well, they're, 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 in this hard fight, there are no rules. You want to do something, do it, but you're gonna get it back. So I so said, okay, well, no rules. Let's go for it. So I fought the first guy, and I fought the second guy, and they were finished quick. The third guy was a little tougher. So I reached down in his pants and I started squeezing his nuts, and I was make made some peanut butter, and then he gave up. Well, I guess you whatever you can. So I guess <laughs> no rules is no rules. And then then, um, then the guy fell down on the ground. Ah! Ah! I said, well, hey, you know, you can take the money away, but you know what? You told me there was no rules. You got me down here and told me there was no rules. And then now there's the no rules. And so now you tell me there's rules. You, you, I, I. So they gave me the money. It was $50,000 to be three people. And you're still champion. Of, uh... Still champion of Ali Tudo. And uh, you ended up coming to Pride. Uh, how did that end up happening after UFC? Uh, you know, somebody called me. Um, Kawasaki, Koji Kawasaki, Booker K, called me from um, from uh, Japan one night and uh, asked me if I'd uh, if I'd fight for them. And I went over there and uh, um, who did I fight first? I fought the uh, uh, Taktarov, Oleg Taktarov. Um, and back then, Oleg Taktarov won a grueling match against. Um, Tank Abbott. And uh, so I fought Oleg Taktarov, and it was rough. And I was so afraid I was going to lose. And I uh, ended up knocking him out quick. What was the difference in the pay structure for Pride, uh, the UFC? Because I've heard you were under a contract where you were just paid monthly rather than per fight. Absolutely. Um, eventually, I, I, be, I, be, I got a good name with him, with Pride. And um, I was in their back pockets. Um, and so I, I started telling them, you know, I, uh, you know what, you're calling me here all the time. Yeah, um, you know, I said, now put me on payroll. I got going back to UFC. So um, I said, I want X number of dollars a month, every month. And then when I fight, I want this much, you know. So so they had to pay. I said, because they're fighting you now and you're not fighting for three months. And, you know, and if somebody gives you $100,000 a day and you're not working, how, is that, how long is that going to last? It's not going to last very long. It may, may last out summer because you'll find things to spend. It just goes. But then after that's gone, then you have your regular bills. You have your, your mortgage. You have your car. You have your uh, child support. You have this. You have, you have all these other bills to pay. So I, I just said, you know, it's easier for me. Pay me monthly. I want X number of dollars a month. Then every fight I want, I want this. 
you know, and they uh, it was finagling back and forth, and you know, they went down, I went up, they went down, I went way up, and, and we settled on the number and got it. You fought Fedor and tried. Uh, what are your memories of that fight, and what are your thoughts on him? As a fight? You know, Fedor is, um, he's, you know, I, him and I, my fireman, his fight with me never got too far. You know, um, very good fighter, um, very nice man. Um, uh, he, he can't speak that much English, so we didn't talk that much. But he, what he did, or how I see Fedor as a fighter, you know, he stays back. He st- you know, as a boxer, you go out there, because I come from boxing around. You go out there, you throw a jab, see how the person reacts. Throw another jab, see how they react. That's how I fight. And that's how I fought every fight. Well, Fedor stayed back, stayed back. And then he went from zero to 100. You know, it's, it was not, a, you know, a boxer, you know, I'll give me 10, give me 10. And then I get into it. He just comes from zero to 100, boom, 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 throwing hard shots. And one of them clipped me and knocked me knocked me out, but I was still standing up. And then he put me away. And what was your uh, favorite memory of fighting for Pride? Um, probably the knockout with Don Fry at the end of it. You know, I really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed that. After and the other two matches, I guess. Yeah, and I also did, uh, I also did some uh, professional wrestling for uh, for Pride that I really liked too. Really liked it. Uh, it was at the time of Pride for a different company. Uh, was it for Antonio? For New Japan, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yes. Is there any reason you didn't pursue the uh, pro wrestling? Because a lot of fighters did. You know what? I, I, I sitting back now. You know, I'm sorry that I didn't because my career would have lasted much longer. But um, I'm hoping, um, you know, uh, uh, talking to Goldberg um, last month or uh, when he was here and three weeks ago, you know, I, I think that I'm going to end up going, going that way um, towards that professional wrestling because, you know, whatever injuries you have, it's okay because you can work around it. And how do you know Goldberg? Um, Goldberg and I became good friends and um, he, came, he was a, the commentator for Pride. And then from there, me, Goldberg, um, Don Fry, um, there was a bunch of people that um, that went on a, a trip in, in California for, for kids. You know, uh, was um, have the kids come with us and we take them out and, you know, we it was mentor all these um, um, underprivileged kids and the kids at the you know, I'm sure some of them are dead today. You know, so uh, we were just giving. Oh, make a wish, make a wish with a with an athlete. That's something out in California. So he used to fly me, fly us out there. And Goldberg came, and we became really good friends um, out um, out in California. And then from there, we just kept it up. We just you know, and we uh, we both have a. You know, he just came from football background. I came from MMA background. We both suffer from the same things in our heads. So so um, it was easiest for us to talk to each other and, and get to know each other. And there was always rumors that Goldberg had a bit of an MMA background, but never actually fought. How do you think he would have done if he had fought him? You know what? I mean, he, he didn't fight him right back then, but um, he, he couldn't have. But his, his first persona on wrestling stage was the MMA background. You know, he fought with the, the Chuck Norris wrist wrap. And, uh, you know, he's training now. He's doing. He's been doing jujitsu now. Um for about three years, he's been doing jiu-jitsu for a while. So he, he now he knows how to fight. Um, back then, he was I I don't think he was he was just a big he would have been just a big brawler. And what did you think of his match against Brock Lesnar? I that? loved it. I loved it. I was uh, he got me. I was like three seats from the ring. I I loved it. He um he invited me down and uh, gave me gave me a few tickets. I I loved it. And did you get a chance to talk to Brock Lesnar at all? As a matter of fact, no. I did not talk to Barker. I didn't even see him. What's your opinion of him as an MMA fighter? Um, you know, Brock Dustin was good. You know, he like he was a world champion at one time. But he was um Brock Lesnar is um they're just just a wrestler, he's a strong, heavy duty wrestler. And once you can find somebody that can brawl and sprawl, which St. Carolyn could, um, brawl and sprawl, and he had enough wrestling in him to to um annul, to nullify what Brock Lesnar was doing stand up and then he can hit on top of it. You know, if Brock Lesnar was to get you down and bring down a pound yet, get you down because he's, he's such a big, strong man. Even I went to, even at 265, I think he had to cut from uh, 285, yeah. you know? So um, get you down, 
physically put you down and just grind you out, elbow you to death. That was his style of fighting. So once he couldn't get you down, he couldn't do anything. That's why I used to, he would, if you hit him, he'd, he'd kind of shy away from that because he doesn't, want, he doesn't want that. And his last opponent in UFC was Mark Hunt, who you actually fought in yeah. K1. Yeah. What did you think of that fight? Mark Hunt, again, you know, his wrestler against a uh, striker. And what's going to happen? You know, Mark Hunt had to be really good at the brawling and sprawling. And, he, you know, Mark Hunt, if he hits, he's going to, see, you're going to sleep. But, you know, it's, it's the exact same. Wrestling against a striker. Ken Shamrock against Hoist Gracie. It was the same thing. You know, Ken Shamrock's going to knock him out. Hoist Gracie's going to submit him. It's the same thing. So you think it was a safe fight for Brock Lesnar to take? And it was a scary fight because he could get hit. But if he played it right, which he did, he's going to get him down. Once he gets him down, he can grind him out. And he ended up failing the uh, drug test after that. And now I guess he's suspended for two years. Uh, do you think he's going to come back and fight again after his suspension is lifted? The thing about it is that how... The thing about it that Mark Hunt uh, said that how the USC knew he was on steroids before the match. And, you know, the, 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 there's a big question about that. If, if somebody's saying that, does not, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. I know Mark Hunt. Personally, I love the guy. You know, um, I love Mark Hunt. I, I really, really like this guy. You know, and I, I'm, I would support him every way he could. But to say that how some a corporation knew that how this person was on steroids, that's that's a pretty pretty tough accusation. You know, um, I, I just feel sorry for the whole thing. You know, because now he's he's lost his job at the UFC. He has to go back to, to go to Bellator to make some money or, or sit home, you know? And for Lesnar, do you think when his suspension is lifted, the UFC will give him another match if he wants it? I don't, I, I don't even know how old he is. Maybe 38. he's 38. So, yeah, I, I think he would. No, he's 38. I didn't know he was that young. He's just a kid. Was uh, CM Punk recently uh, joined yeah. UFC. What did you think of that whole kind of bizarre situation where they signed him without having any experience? And then you know what? Uh, they were just um, they, they. I think UFC was just playing around with um with um, wrestler because wrestler has a big wrestling has a big following. I didn't even know that till um to Brock uh, brought me up to this uh, this one here. I had no idea they had so many fans. I was I was impressed. So uh, yeah, I, I think UFC was playing with it a little bit. Um, give give them a I, but um, I think they're probably gonna stop now because Sam Punk sucked ass. What happens when when you fight? Um, and it's quite different from wrestling, um, professional wrestling. When you happen when you fight, sometimes, um, what I just said at the beginning, you you sometimes you go out there and your brain just blanks, and uh, and that's what you really it's a it's a place that you never want to go. But you're always afraid. Well, me, I was always afraid of going out there and you just go blank. And I'm sure that he trained for two years and he went blank. He he just lost everything. I think that the every the hype they had the hip and the hype got a hold of him. I, he, but many people say, well, he was a professional artist. He should have never got. It. But he, it's still fighting for your life and fighting for just showing a, a game, just just playing. It's two different things. Fighting and dancing are two different things, you know? So um, when you go out there and you, you actually fight somebody, I could see how his head had to go brank. So, yeah, I think he learned a lot, but he didn't have time to play. He needed to go out there and go easy into it. Rather, than... That's what happened to him. He needed to go out there and get a jab and relax and then fight. He didn't have that. So I, I think he... Um, he squashed himself. Take your time. He, he did take your time. He should have got a, a low class match first. Um, um, not fighting somebody like that right away. Relax. Take your take your time. Fight a little low level fights. Say your name, somebody else, and go into a fight. You know. And you mentioned uh, that you were offered uh, the fixed fight in Pride. Do you think that happened uh, to other fighters? Absolutely, it happened. Um, Pride won. About 75% of their matches were fixed. Pride 2, about 50% of their matches were fixed. Pride 3, about 25% of their matches were fixed. Pride 4, maybe 10%, and it just went down from there. Was it the company themselves fixing The company. Them? The company fixed them. See, they wanted, it was something new in Japan, 
and they needed to get people on their side. So they had pro wrestlers come in and fight each other. And they had fighters from America come over there and fight each other, other people over there, and that's what they did. And you said that there was obviously no drug testing in Pride. Uh, did you ever see anything unusual there with uh, performance enhancing? I saw people, I saw shooting up in the bathroom. Yes, I didn't see that. And the uh, company was aware of it, you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, is there any particular reason why during that time, uh, like you didn't go into pro wrestling, you just didn't want to go into pro wrestling? It, it was it was something else I didn't, it was something I didn't know, and I was too busy with fighting at the time. But you ended up making your debut in Heroes against another pro wrestler, Sylvester Turkai. Yeah. And uh, you beat him. He had a pretty impressive amateur wrestling background, but uh, you beat him pretty easily. Um, the thing is, um, Heroes, Pride, they were the exact same thing. The same owners, they just changed the name. Um, so Heroes, Pride. Um, the only thing that was different is uh, Pride and Heroes, and then uh, K1. That was the difference. But Heroes and Pride, the exact same thing, same owners. They just changed names. Changed, they changed. They went home and changed their shirts. Well, that was the difference. Now, K1, um, um, fighting Turkey, man, I, I was so afraid. I was so afraid this guy was going to wrap me up, take me down, beat the shit out of me. Pardon, pardon the French. We can use that French word here. <laughs> um, I thought he was going to take me down and beat the crap out of me. And uh, I was really looking for that. And then we started going out there, referee says go, we're walking around looking at each other. We're walking around. I give him a little jab, see what's happening. He ducks out of there, starts fighting back. He throws a kick, give him a little jab again. And he's, and he's not shooting. I'm like, holy shit, he's not shooting. But I'm still afraid that he's gonna shoot and take me down into his way he wants to fight. But he didn't, I ended up clipping his chin and his legs went wobbly and I ran after him and knocked him out really quick because I wanted that fight to be done yesterday. Yeah. And uh, that's what happened. But the thing is that how he's such, a, such an amazing wrestler if he that height that fight had to happen however he wanted to happen. If he wanted to stand up, so we stood up. He wanted to go to the ground, we would have went to the ground. But the thing is he fought where he wanted to fight. Um he is he fought a, a match before mine and he realized, hey, I got some hands, I get it. Because he knocked an opponent out. Did you did you know that? He knocked yeah. an opponent out just before my match. Um he knocked the opponent out and it was so easy for him. I think he, he thought I want to do it to Gary. So uh, when I came up, I said, oh, I'm going to give you some of this. And he hit me a few times, and I didn't go. And then I had the answer back, and it was the end of it. And you also fought uh, Jerome with Banner, a pretty yeah. big kickboxing legend. Uh, were you nervous going into that fight? Oh, absolutely. I wanted to beat this guy. I was, again, um, I was out of my way out of my league. Um, there was no way possible that I could beat this guy. He was... You know, I, I was uh, fighting him in K1. It was it was rough. It was K1 was rough. They they fed me the lines there. And, what uh, made you switch to uh, kickboxing? They just made me an offer. And then it's like, Gary, yeah, you want to go fight for us? They made me an offer. Um, um, Mr. Ishii, Control made me an offer. I couldn't refuse. And I I did it. And you fought the the giant Chohan man there as well. Hung Man Choi, yeah, Hung Man seven Choi, foot yeah. three, yeah. Yeah, what was that like? Because oh, you had a man. reputation for destroying people. Too. Oh, I was, uh, you know, fighting somebody seven foot three, 390 pounds, or 420, 390, 420. Um, it, was, it was difficult. It was a difficult thing to do. I had a rough time fighting this man. Um, I, I didn't even know how to fight this guy. And uh, was, would he have been one of the most powerful guys you ever fought? Not powerful. I, I fought a, a Russian guy. Um, it was like four fifty-five, six foot five, and man, not only was he the strongest man I've ever fought, man, he had the strongest breath. This guy, <laughs> his breath smelled like my ass. Oh, it was terrible. It was his breath smelled like his shit. Pardon the French. Let me tell you, man, this guy's uh, smell. That's the only thing I remember with him. Other than being the strongest guy, his breath was just as strong. And what was the favorite match that you had in K1? The favorite match I have in K1? Um, my favorite match is there. Um, actually, 
anytime I knock somebody out, it's a favorite match. So how many knockouts did I have? 50 of them, 50%. I love knocking people out. And I heard that you took a fight in 22 minutes at one point. How does that happen? You know, when you go to um, when you go to watch a fight, and I I can't remember exactly what fight it was. I went to watch a fight to corner Tom Erickson, and they asked me, "Yeah, hey, would you? Uh, we're kind of stuck on that. Can you can you fight?" And I bored somebody shorts and went out and fought. I I bored somebody shorts, and I bored their jock, but I changed. I, I wanted to use a cup, and then they had to give me a new jock strap because I did not want to put his crotch with my crotch, you know. That's the only thing that happened. It's just an offer you couldn't refuse because you were there. Uh, well, they were kind of stuck, and, you know, I, I was happy to do it. When did you start having problems with your uh, your head and noticing the effect? You know what? I, I didn't notice everybody around me started noticing. Um, I just said that. I just said that. We just talked about that, Gary. Yeah. Everyone started doing that to me. Um, that's when uh, that's when I that's when things are more warming up. And now you suffer from CTE. For people that don't know what that is, can you just tell us what that is? Well, CTE is um, chronic traumatic encephalophagy encephalo or whatever. Uh, what it is is um, uh, it's when your your brain gets rattled around in your head. Your head is um, think of it as um, a, a bone filled with water and, you're, and the egg is in there and it's shaking up the egg you break the egg well that's how my head was and uh, people were doing that and uh, and I didn't get that in MMA I got that in um, K1 because you said I had got knocked out yeah. for 15 times right yeah so um, yeah because um, you can't hold on or anything yeah you, you, once you go to the ground you get back up and that's where in, in MMA, I got knocked out once. I had a concussion one time with Gilbert Avell. And then I had a concussion, um, probably with 20 concussions in uh, K1. I ended up uh, being knocked out four, uh, four, th 15 times, but I had about 20, 25 concussions. Do you think the athletic commission should be stricter on people who've had multiple knockouts? Absolutely. Absolutely, I, 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 I can say I can cut you off and say absolutely, one hundred percent. And I've also heard you say you fought for some companies that didn't even do any blood testing before. Yep, I fought for some companies. Um, um, uh, just had some. Uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, yeah, I fought for some companies that uh, never did any blood testing. Like another person, Mike Mike Bernardo, he took himself. He took his life on a couple months, a couple years ago. Mike Bernardo, he fought people in Japan. And he had AIDS. And I'm like, how can this guy be fighting? Like, we didn't know until after. How can this guy be fighting? And the company knows. And he fights people and then with with HIV. Of course, if you, if you, I fought him. I He probably had HIV then too. But, uh, you know, thankfully, we didn't cut. We didn't uh, get cut. He got knocked out quick. So you think that, uh, like, for instance, Canada should have a stricter commission uh, looking over fighters records if they want to fight and let's say they've had 10 knockouts in their career 100 percent, 100 percent. uh knockouts are terrible you know um and now uh, people need to get on top of them when, when somebody gets concussed or like that they, they need to stop uh, and get, take a break and a bunch of fighters have recently come together including george st pierre to try and start a fighters union i guess an ex-bellator ceo is involved with it too uh, what are your thoughts on a fighters union? I think that's great. You know, the the companies uh, don't want it to happen, but it's something that you need. Anytime there was a, anytime there was a union going up in any business, people don't want it there because it's going to make them pay more money. So, but you see, a million dollar company, billion dollar company. Why wouldn't uh, why wouldn't they want to help people or help themselves? And uh, what's your best advice for fighting that you would? Uh, give an up-and-coming fighter? I would tell a fighter that, that if he was going to continue fighting, he better save his money because the money goes away really quick. Um, everybody that I know of right now that I fought in time when I fought were all damaged. Um, everybody that I know, um, they're all damaged. I, I got brain injury. Um, people I know replaced their shoulders. I'm waiting for two replacements. They got to replace both my shoulders right now. 
as well. Thankfully, I live in Canada. I don't have to pay that out of my ass. Um, oh, sorry, pardon my French. Um, I don't have to pay that out of my pocket. Um, you know, people replacing their hips. There's like a lot of expensive things that are happening, and nobody from when I them from my era is, uh, is is proper because we all have injuries. We all have injuries. We all fought all the time because um, we could and we're allowed to. So we, you, you know, the more you fight, the more money you make. So you fight. Um, we're all we're all damaged. We're all damaged. What's important if you're like about to have an MMA fight and you're going to advise a fighter on how to, what to work on? What do you think is the most important? Uh, the most important thing is cardio. Cardio, cardio, cardio. And then there's different kinds of cardio. There's cardio, you can you can be able to run um, 26 miles. 26, you can be able to run a marathon, but you lose the MMA fight in cardio. There's different cardios and you have to have, you have, to have them all. There's cardio in the ring for... Um, there's cardio for running, the running cardio that I'm talking about. And then there's cardio for um for wrestling cardio. There's a different cardio. A lot of people don't know this. And they oh, I just finished running 10 miles. I got great cardio. No, there's different cardios. There's muscular endurance, and then there's just endurance. And how do you think UFC's uh, businesses right now, they've just laid off a bunch of employees. They're not coming to Toronto as often or Montreal as often. <laughs> do you think it's still climbing up or has it already reached its peak in success um i don't know i think it's still climbing up I, people love it it's, you know i love it I, I never miss one i never miss the ufc i miss bellators because uh, i don't know why i just miss bellators I, I i never miss the ufc what do you think of them releasing chuck liddell recently i guess he was under some type of uh it, contract chuck liddell company, yeah. i guess he wasn't under a fighting contract but he had some kind of uh, I have no idea. I thought Chuck Liddell, uh, I thought he was too old or something. I, I don't know. And uh, is there anything you would have done differently in your career? Yeah, I would have um, listened, to, listened to my corner when I uh, thought I had too much. And I've seen a video of your daughter on YouTube doing a speech about you. Uh, yeah. How many kids do you have? I have two, two daughters, one 14 and one uh, 16. And are you uh, married now or anything? No, I'm not married. Would you uh, train them at all for fighting? Is that something? I do. I train them right now. I trained uh, the youngest one. I train her for fighting. The, uh, <laughs> the oldest one, she wants to play basketball. Are you still involved in MMA at all, training people? Or yeah, I you? train people. Um, I train at the – actually, we just changed our name up in Barry, uh, the Canada top team. Uh, the Can Canadian top team, I train up in uh, Barry. Um, you should be hearing about it. Now, anybody that wants to train, that wants to move their, their fighting level up to the next level – or prepare for a fight, that's what we do up there. And we're heavy striking. We're heavy striking. There's the wrestling as well. We're heavy striking as well. And people that want to uh, contact you or find, follow you on social media, where would they go to find you? Oh, I have Twitter. Um, at, uh, at Gary Goodrich. Yes, sir. Gary H. Goodrich. And you have Facebook too, I guess. Absolutely. But my Facebook, I have five Facebooks and they're all full. So uh, Twitter is, is the easiest way to get hold of me. And how do you want people to uh, remember you as a fighter? Um, exactly what I was. You know, I was a fighter. I fought, I fought anybody. I never feared no one, fought everyone. And finally, is there any message that you want to uh, give to your fans that are going to watch this video? I want to say to my fans, thank you very much for uh, following me all the years, um, giving me support and love. And, uh, you know, I, I love I love what I did. I, I love what I do even now. I You know, I love it. Well, thanks a lot for doing this with us, and we hope to see you in uh, professional wrestling in the future. The pleasure was all yours.